Good evening, everyone, and thanks for joining us this evening for the first in a series of talks organised by the Civil Liberties team at Garden Court Chambers. Our session today will focus on malicious prosecution and misfeasance in public office. My name is Fatima Jishi, and I'm a barrister and a member of the Civil Liberties team. And I'm joined today by Stephen Simblick QC, Una Morris and Michael Etienne. It's so wonderful to see so many of you sign up and across various areas of law. As you can imagine, our topic today is something you're likely to come across, whether you're a civil or a criminal practitioner. So I'm very much looking forward to it. We have three experts with us today in these two topics. You, um, Stephen will start by speaking on malicious prosecution in particular, who's the prosecutor, what reasonable cause is, and malice. And he's going to touch upon the impact of the Reese case, which of course um, features Stephen himself. Yuna will then speak about misfeasance in public office and will touch on what counts as an act, the various ways in which the talk can be used and vicarious liability. And finally, Michael will be speaking about loss and damages. So there's quite a lot to cover. So I'm going to get stuck straight in. There will be plenty of time for questions and answers. I'd encourage you to use the Q&A function as opposed to the chat so we can gather those questions. And I'll introduce each of the speakers as we go along. So starting with Stephen Simbler. Stephen's practice focuses on individual rights in four discrete areas. These are civil claims against the police and public authorities, inquests, mental health and court of protection, and finally, public law and judicial review. Stephen was one of the lead advocates representing bereaved families in the Hillsborough inquest and has appeared as an advocate in a number of public inquiries. Stephen specialises in claims for false imprisonment, assault, malicious prosecution and misfeasance in public office against the police, prison authorities and psychiatric hospitals. Stephen is highly experienced in trials in this area and conducts many high court and county court trials in these types of claims every year and advises in countless others that settle on favourable terms. He's appeared in many of the leading appellate decisions in this area and is one of the most experienced lawyers in the country in this sort of litigation and is ranked highly in the Chambers UK Bar Guide in this area. Stephen was also involved in some of the first damages claims under the Human Rights Act. He was the lead advocate in a case before the European Court of Human Rights concerning forcible entry by police in a decision important enough to be report reported in the European Human Rights Report. Importantly for this session, he represented one of the successful claimants in Reese, both in the lengthy High Court trial, in the appeal and on the trial of damages. His legal knowledge and skill at pleading meant he was commissioned to write the section on malicious prosecution for the latest edition of the Atkins Court Forms. Stephen, I'm going to hand over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Fatima. Um, I, I see there are people still joining, actually. I mean, so as, as Fatima was... Uh, was talking there. There were there were people still uh, clicking, and I I think we, we we might as well carry on though because the number seems to have settled down a bit. But yeah, we'll uh, start there. Um, I'm going to start. Well, I'm, the first thing I'm going to do is show that I'm less technically competent by anyone else because every time I share my screen, I have to do it again. And there we go. I'm going to share this screen. Start. This slideshow. Is that a slideshow in Fatima? Yes, it is. Good, right. Um, that's, our that's our title. That's my, me. Um, I'm giving you some references and citations to reach. I'm not going to um, go through each of them, but basically there are four aspects that will be featured in, in this talk, and the bottom bullet point explains uh, what it's uh, about. The, the, the first two relate to the substantive claim, and the second two relate to um, the uh, claim, the, the damages uh, awards, which were contested and then uh, in one of the cases uh, appealed. Now, the Reese case, which is out in our title, is, is the civil claim brought by various people who had been uh, pro prosecuted in relation to the unsolved and current uh, Daniel Morgan uh, investigation, uh, which has been all over the news recently. In fact, since we wrote these uh, slides, it's um, it's been uh, uh, there's been new news about it and so on. And I won't 
linger over this slide because it's been in the in the papers uh, last week and so on. One thing that my second to last bullet point there, um, case mired in prominent allegations of serious corruption. Of course, one of the uh, reported findings of the inquiry is that the, the police were institutionally corrupt. So the, the, the point about the circumstances in which these uh, the people were prosecuted and the uh, case uh, and, and the civil claims arose was that the case is still a, a continuing embarrassment to Metropolitan Police. And there was a, a, a lot of um, talk about it, pressure and so on, in the uh, very highest ranks of, of Scotland Yard. In fact, we had Assistant Commissioner Yates flown back, retired now, but flown back from Australia, where he now lives, to give evidence for the police in this. So it's, you know, it's a, it's a, it had been a case that had been at the very uh, top um, uh, of Scotland Yard decision making. Um, I won't go through the uh, series of investigations in detail, but they are summed up as to what had happened before uh, any of the Reese claimants were actually prosecuted uh, in, in, the, uh, in, in, in the title series of investigations leading nowhere. Um, the, as we can see, as we now know, the first investigation was uh, probably corrupt. Um, and I will mention and with the case there of Goodrich and Chief Constable of Hampshire, which people who um, are, work in this area will know is still a useful case on disclosure of reports. Now, Goodrich was the um, I suppose, well, uncle by marriage to one of the people who was a claimant uh, in, in the Reese litigation. It's quite interesting that there was um, some evidence uh, or, or the police have thought there'd been some evidence against him, uh, yet by the time they got to uh, our claimants, were, 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 had dropped him entirely. And in fact, he had successful, Paul Goodridge had um, in the I think early 90, in the early 2000s, successfully settled his own claim for malicious prosecution. So the, the, the whole Daniel Morgan thing had already given rise to a, um, a, a successful claim of for malicious prosecution before the case that we're talking about um, 20, 15, 20 years later. Now, I've headed this DCS David Cook uh, put in charge. Uh, DCS David Cook used to be one of the police officers they had on uh, Crime Watch, and he was a sort of public figure in the in the Scotland in Scotland Yard. And when the higher echelons of the Met were getting nowhere in solving this. And because of the um, quite right, uh, rightful and effective campaigning by uh, Daniel Morgan's family, um, a, another attempt at investigating the Morgan uh, murder was, was uh, set up under uh, this officer, David Cook, the high ranking detective chief superintendent. So when we come on to some of the issues Michael will be talking about, that may be uh, something of, of, of relevance. Um, and he um, merged various different operations into sort of South London um, criminals and criminal and, and, and alleged criminals into, into how they all interfaced with the Daniel Morgan case. And in fact, anybody who does um, serious criminal trials, I don't, but anybody who does any uh, any sort of serious organised crime sort of stuff will 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 report that uh, for years and years that, that there was always a sort of row about disclosure and alleged links to the Daniel Morgan murder and all of this sort of thing. So it's a case that had sort of permeated the fabric of policing and criminal um, in, in criminal investigations and so on for years. But why Cook uh, had been put in charge was because he they wanted him to use his useful. Uh, media links. And one of the things he did was planted a story that the Daniel Morgan murder was being reinvestigated in the hope that various people might come forward uh, with information. And it, they set up uh, um, a, this is all described in the, the paragraph references here are all references to the um, judgment of Mr. Justice Mitting, who goes through in very great detail um, the chronology. So I'm, that's why I'm not lingering much on telling you what it's about, because I want to get onto the substantive legal point that arise. Um, 
But what Cook had done, as Mitting found, was that when a, a man who came forward called Gary Eaton uh, met with the police, um, Cook and the police officer with him fed um, this Gary Eaton um, the, their theory of the case, essentially, with give me the name of the brothers. And the brothers referring to Gary Vine, who was my client, uh, and his uh, brother Glenn Vine, the, the one who was uh, related to uh, by marriage to Goodrich. Um, so, in a sense, there was concerns about the, the way in which all of this information was going to be managed and dealt with from the start. And as we shall see, next slide, um, the significance or apparent significance of Gary Eaton was that this, this in, these inquiries, which so far had been a whole series of um, hedging and chiseling and negotiating with different unreliable and, and people um, with, a, with their own motives for wanting to get something from the police, or either they were trial themselves, all those sorts of things. What they're now, what, and who could only report sort of reported conversations and so on, what they're now was, was an alleged eyewitness. Or oh, that's where they got to. Eaton, imp importantly, Gary Eaton did not say at the very first, I was there. Um, but as the um, taking of accounts and things evolved from him, that's ultimately where it ended up. And the reason for this, and is set out in the first bullet point here, Gary Eaton was supposed to be being debriefed in a sterile corridor, but wasn't. And there was clear and objective uh, evidence that um, DCS Cook had regularly been in contact uh, with, um, with Gar uh, Eaton in breach of the sterile corridor arrangements that had been put in place. Now, I, I, I imagine most people know what those are, but for those who don't, it's essentially when you've got um, somebody who is um, giving information as an informant and they need to uh, separate uh, him from the investigation. They have a very um, um, formal um, procedure for, for taking that person's account called the sterile corridor. And they essentially put officers who were not involved in other parts of the um, operation into, into the uh, death of, of Daniel Morgan to take those accounts. The, the aim being that they wouldn't therefore be influenced by what they had learned on other aspects of the information. So it's a very important uh, procedure for maintaining the integrity of the investigation and the integrity of the information they got from Gary Eaton, but it was totally subverted by David Cook. Um, and there was clear evidence about this. And in, indeed, in the uh, criminal prosecution that was uh, brought against uh, Gary Vian, Glenn Vian, Jonathan Rees, and uh, an another man, Jimmy Cook, um, they, they, there was a, a lengthy voir dire with cross-examination of Cook and the various other officers going on for days and days, in which they plainly, um, uh, or in which they plainly had been feeding him information or manipulating information, and that's the finding which, that we see in the bullet point there. Um, uh, that the uh, essentially the um, accounts being taken from Gary Eaton were being potentially influenced by the communications he was having with the with David Cook. Um, so where it ends up is what's summarized in the bottom three bullet points. The, the, they moved to the point where there was now an eyewitness. Um, and importantly, as, as for the prospects of the civil claim that we were involved in, um, it turned out uh, that, that Mr. Justice Mitting was able to make a finding of fact in the civil claim that, claim that the scene as de depicted by Gary Eaton could not have occurred. And it was unlikely that he had seen the, uh, the, the body in the way that he described. And furthermore, it must have been clear to the uh, experienced team of investigating officers that his account just wasn't right. I'll move to the next slide. We then see, um, top bullet point, Gary Eaton's evidence was important to the case as a whole. And another important finding, or what you'd hope was an important finding by Mr. Justice Mitting, 
that it had been contaminated by the actions of Cook, which Cook deliberately withheld from the CPS and Treasury Council. And indeed, Mr Justice Mitching at 186 of the judgment went even further. I'm satisfied that what um, Cook had done, based on what the, the, the findings of the trial judge in the voir dire, was a crime itself, the crime of an act tending to and intended to pervert the course of justice. So he subverted the sterile corridor system. And essentially, if somebody was being put forward as an uncontaminated and reliable eyewitness in this, um, in, in this case, when in fact, there were all sorts of problems with that evidence. And it did in fact come about as a consequence of acts tending to pervert the course of justice. So as I put in my bullet point there, we'd all hope that was a, a winning case. Um, but it wasn't. So we'll move on to the next slide. I'm reminding everyone of what the elements of a claim for malicious prosecution are. Well, they show the claim was prosecuted by the defendant without reasonable and probable cause, with malice, the proceedings ended in the claimant's favour and the proceedings caused damage to the claimant. And I've taken those from the uh, Supreme Court and House of Lords references given there. I'm going to focus in my talk on who the prosecutor is without what without reasonable and probable causes and how um, malice can be inferred in these circumstances. So I'll just move on. Yeah, I've said it wasn't a winning case. Despite those clear findings, Mr. Justice Mitting thought that he could isolate other evidence against uh, the three claimants, um, Jonathan Reese, Glenn Vian, and Gary Vian. Um, and essentially say, well, if you take away this corrupted evidence from Gary Eaton, there is still, or there was still, sufficient evidence to charge those three people. There had also been a fourth claimant who was, in fact, one of the police officers involved in the initial investigation, a, a bloke called Sid uh, Fillery, and in his case... Um, he was, when, after the, um, Mr. Justice Madison made the findings that he did in a voir dire and Eaton's evidence was ruled out, the case against Fillory collapsed at that very moment. So the, 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 the three people we're looking at here um, were those that Mitting thought that you could uh, identify other bits of evidence and make a finding that there was reasonable and probable cause. I'll move to my next slide. So, yeah, the, the, this is the issue about, well, what, what effect um, is there on a case where um, you've got evidence um, procured in, essentially by the uh, um, uh, senior investing, investigating officer that results in um, unreliable and corrupted evidence but there is still some other evidence. And according to uh, Mr. Justice Mitting, um, you, you could, you know, this is the bottom bullet point, uh, just take Eaton's evidence out of the mix and then say there's sufficient to proceed against the others. The two points, uh, the two intervening bullet points there will be something that Yuna's talk will mention, but one, one thing you can say about Mr. Justice Mitting's uh, High Court judgment um, and, and what parts of the law from it still survive is if it actually is a concrete example, because of what I've told you about the claim brought by Hillary, of a case of a claimant succeeding in misfeasance in public office um, arising out of the manufacturing or tainting of evidence. So it's not just strikeouts or theoretical possibilities, Fillory won his case before Mitting in misfeasance. He didn't win in malicious prosecution for the reasons we'll see about, and that it made no difference to the outcome. Um, so he has, you know, there is a high court authority saying this is um, how misfeasance can be used. I'll move on to what I'm talking about. Well, despite Mr. Justice Mitting's uh, very stark factual findings, uh, his rejection that this amounted to a claim in, in malicious prosecution um, was also, uh, we thought, stark. And the three unsuccessful claimants, Gary Vian, Glenn Vian, and Jonathan Rees, appealed to the Court of Appeal. 
And this is what um, the Court of Appeal said about the approach to tainted evidence and what, the, what's the, what should have happened below. Mr. Just, uh, Lord Justice McCombe's dictum, I find it inconceivable that any properly informed prosecutor or counsel advising him or her would have countenanced, countenanced the preferring of charges on the relevant date, based as they were on the report of an SIO who procured a significant plank of the proposed Crown case by committing the crime which the judge held DCS had committed. And he points out you know, the, the obvious practical implications that if, if you found that was going on in the case, that you would want to remove the SIO. Um, similarly, similarly strong comments from uh, Lord Justice Coulson. Um, and essentially the analysis of how what Mr. Justice Mitting had done was just intellectually deficient. He had only thought that somehow you could remove Eaton's evidence, whereas he ought to have gone on and, and went and looking at what the what is meant by absence of reasonable and probable cause to see whether the pro criminal proceedings would have been commenced, um, where the new and compelling evidence that brackets now removed had only been obtained through criminal conduct. He says it's simply you can't just try and pick and mix or subtract. Uh, Eaton's evidence on the e equation. And then this, I, I'm, I want to talk about the bottom bullet point and the next slide also deals with this. Um, as you can see, one of the important, not necessary issues for claiming malicious prosecution is to work out whether there was, uh, or whether there is reasonable and probable cause. And one of the things um, that arose out of a decision taken by the Met in the civil proceedings was that um, there was no um, material in the form of reports or advices or information from those involved in CBS decision taking about what had led them to carry on with the case after um, Eaton's evidence had been removed, or indeed what had led them to bring the case uh, be be before Eaton's evidence was removed. So essentially, what the Met was hoping was that they, that they could sit back and say, well, the proceedings against Gary Vine, Glenn Vine and Jonathan Rees continued even after Eaton's evidence was taken away. So therefore, we can infer that the uh, prosecution would have been brought anyway. And Lord Justice Coulson um, explained some of the difficulties with a defendant taking that approach, uh, not least because uh, we were able... To put, well, I'll, I'll, uh, we were, I'll skip on and then come back inside. We, we were able to point to a case, Mountcher and Chief Council of, of South Wales, in which both Una and I uh, were, uh, were counsel for one of the claimants, where the police had done exactly that. They had disclosed advices, documents, and records in relation to decisions to prosecute. And indeed, we even had the uh, um, difficult position of having to cross-examine the various prosecution counsel involved in the, decision, in the decision in that case, one of whom was by then a circuit judge and the, the presiding judge, I think, at uh, Leicester Crown Court. So, you know, it was quite clear that it is open to the police to make disclosure of um, information uh, in relation to prosecutorial decision-making and the um, to and fro of information with the CPS. And indeed, I think, one of the points, and I didn't want to push it too hard, but it, I did draw attention <coughs> to the fact that the leading counsel for <coughs> the Met in Reese had also been leading counsel for the uh, South Wales Police in Mountshire. So it couldn't be a sort. Of, it couldn't be that he didn't think it was disclosable. It was. It was clearly a case of trying to play, you know, use it as a card rather than a. Uh, <coughs> um, rather than actually a, 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 an informed and forensic view on the law. So I'll go back to the, so, so, so those are the things that it said about reasonable and probable cause. I'll go back to malice and what the Court of Appeal said about that. Or I will do if I can get my slides. Yeah. <coughs> yeah, now one feature of our case was that DCS Cook had left the Met under a cloud. In fact, he, he was all a, a significant figure in the Leveson inquiry and all the um, uh, links to the news of the world and all of that that was uh, going on between the Met and Reese's um, investigation firm. Um, 
and he was uncooperative. So while the Met wanted, and indeed they, they rather cheekily obtained an order ex parte that, uh, that they could serve simply a witness summary from him rather than the witness statement at the appropriate time, and had written a sort of script of what they were hoping he would say rather than any information about what he actually would say, and they were never able to get um, get hold of him. So he wasn't called as a witness. And um, we would say um, that in those circumstances, not only from the objective facts can you um, uh, infer malice, but you can also infer malice from the fact that the person accused of malice doesn't show up. And indeed, there's a, there's a case of mine, which, which isn't uh, included in the materials here, but called Paul and Chief Constable of Humberside, where Lord Justice Brooke sets out um, how a court can infer um, malice uh, in the tort of malicious prosecution. Um, Mitting declined to infer it, and the Court of Appeal said that was nonsense. And Lady Justice King there um, says, I would endorse without hesitation the conclusion of uh, Lord Justice McCune that DCS Cook was a prosecutor who acted maliciously. Um, he observes any other finding would be a negation of the rule of law, uh, and calls on LJ, it would be contrary to basic principle. This is undoubtedly the case. Any other view in any other conclusion would, in the eyes of the general public, defy common sense. And she likened it to saying, well, I'm saying that uh, um, Mitting's finding was, was rather like saying that Robin Hood was not guilty of theft. So that's what they had to say about malice. That's what it's about absence of reasonable and probable cause. It was also um, the case. I'm going to move my next slide. Um, uh, the, the Mitting, uh, Mr. Justice Mitting, had found um, that the um, police were not the prosecutor. So we raise here who is the who is the prosecutor um, when the C, when when the CPS is misled. I'm not sure when we've missed the slide. No, they want right. Good. Um, what? Mr. Justice Mitting had said was that Cook's con conduct did not mean that the prosecutorial authorities were deprived of the ability to exercise an independent discretion. So he decided, as we just see at the bottom there, that uh, Cook was not to be treated as the person who had caused the prosecution. So we had failed to prove the first elements of the tort. All right. Um, the real question, and why Mr. Justice Mitting got that wrong, um, is, 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 is to look at it as not just who is the prosecutor, but to understand that there may be more than one. So in a case of, say, indecent assault, which is what Martin and Watson are, is about, where the complainant um, was the only person who knew what had happened, um, and it, it was possible to say that she was the cause of the, prosecuting, of, of, the, of the prosecution. But there were other cases, other sides of the line, and I won't go through them all, all here. One of them is a hunt, a H and AB, which is at the, uh, at the bottom there. Um, but it, it, essentially, um, there, are, there are two tests, or, or two tests which, in, which I would say reach the same result. Um, the case of Copeland, which I've set out there, um, approved a test as to whether the uh, police officer who was in, instrumental in the bringing of the prosecution meant that he would be the prosecutor. Uh, the question asked in that case, and that doesn't appear in the report, so if you're interested in this in this topic, uh, uh, um, Heather Williams uh, and uh, Jude Bunting, who were in that case, were kind enough to supply us the question but, but so that we could put it before the court of appeal in uh, um, Reese. The question in Copeland had been, has the claimant proved, it's more likely than not, that the police officer had deliberately fabricated his account of her hitting him in the face in the statement used for her prosecution in the magistrate's court. And in, in that sort of situation where that is instrumental in the bringing of the prosecution, then the police become a prosecutor, irrespective of the involvement of the CPS. Um, in Reese, Lord Justice McCoon said um, it, it, the, 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 it falls squarely what, within what in Hunt has been said as to be deliberately manipulated the CPS into taking a course which they would otherwise not have taken um, and over, had been overborne and perverted by his presentation to the, of the material to the CPS with the implicit suggestion that the procurement was not tainted in the manner that it was. So essentially, if you have 
fabricated evidence that um, plainly um, results in somebody taking a, 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 a reviewing authority such as the CPS taking a course that they would not otherwise have taken, then you are a prosecutor for the purposes of this talk. And that's, um, that's where I'll finish. Uh, thank you very much for listening. I know I've gone a bit longer, but uh, um, there we are. I'll try and stop sharing now. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, We're going to take questions at the end, um, but I am keeping an eye on the Q&A box. So please do put any questions or comments you have there and we can um, go through them at the end. Our next speaker is Una Morris. Uh, Una is a leading civil liberties, human rights and public law practitioner with a diverse practice. Her significant expertise extends across a range of different areas, including claims against the police and public authorities, inquests, inquiries, public law, abuse claims, data and privacy, protest rights, youth justice and child rights, prisoners' rights and discrimination. She has a wide ranging experience in advising and representing claimants in civil claims for damages. She has expertise across the full spectrum of torts, claims under the Human Rights Act and breaches of other statutory duties. Una has a substantial paperwork practice and she regularly negotiates or advises on settlements on behalf of claimants and has appeared for claimants in cases tried by judge alone in civil jury trials and in a number of appeals. Her experience in this area includes claims against the police, claims against other detaining authorities, including prisons and immigration authorities, claims involving probation, claims against local authorities, and claims involving healthcare and other state bodies. Una also co convenes the civil liberties team and is public access qualified. Thank you, Una. Thanks very much, Fatima. Uh, there we go. Uh, so my talk is on misfeasance in public office and in particular I'll be focusing on what is an act of misfeasance and how can a talk be used. So the starting point for consideration of misfeasance in public office is the judgment in the Free Rivers District Council and others and Governor and Bank of England and that's the case that's number three. And as it says on the slide there, following the collapse of BCCI, a claim by some 6,000 depositors of BCCI's UK branch against the Bank of England in misfeasance in public office. And the question there in relation to misfeasance in public office was whether they had wrongly granted a license to BCCI or in failing to revoke BCI, BCCI's license on the basis that the bank knew, believed, or suspected that BCCI would probably collapse without being rescued. And in broad terms, for our purposes today, because there was also an issue of community law in that case, but for our purposes, the question before the House of Lords in the Free Rivers case is, what is the correct definition of the tour in misfeasance in public office? Alternatively, what are the ingredients of the tour? And I'm going to focus on the judgment of Lord Stein because there was either full agreement or broad agreement with his definition of the tort and the ingredients set out. And the very first point is that the defendant must be a public officer. And there Lord Stein said, it is the office in a relatively wide sense on which everything depends. Thus a local authority exercising private law functions as a landlord is potentially capable of being sued and then refers to the case of Jones and Swansea City Council. The second ingredient which links back to the first is that there is a requirement for the exercise of power as a public officer. And, and in that particular case, in the Free Rivers case, that ingredient was not an issue. And you'll note that it is possible for someone to be a public officer, but they have committed an act which is outside of the scope of their public office. And therefore, if, if that was the case, then the second requirement would fail. So there has to be a link between the public officer status and the exercise of power. The third requirement then concerns the state of mind of the defendant and what Lord Stein said was the case law reveals two different forms of liability for misfeasance in public office. First, 
There is the case of targeted malice by a public officer, i.e. conduct specifically intended to injure a person or persons. And this type of case will involve bad faith in the sense of the exercise of public power for an improper or ulterior motive. The second form then is where a public officer acts knowing that he has no power to do the act complained of and that the act will probably injure the plaintiff. And we'll come on to look at some cases where that question has been considered. And what Lord Stein then says is it involves bad faith in as much as the public officer does not have an honest belief that his act is lawful. But there's also a question of recklessness. And you can see in the next quote there, Lord Stein said the plaintiff must prove and note there that the burden of proof is on the plaintiff or as we say now, the claimant, that the public officer acted with a state of mind of reckless indifference to the illegality of his act. So the fourth ingredient then is about the duty to the plaintiff or claimant. The question is who can sue in respect of an abuse of power by a public officer? And then what Lord Stein says is it would be unwise to make general statements. Oh, sorry, I'll just go back. It would be unwise to make general statements. Forgive me, I'm uh, just trying to find. Oh, there we go. Um, it would be unwise to make general statements on a subject which may involve many diverse situations. And we'll look at some of the diverse situations which can arise in misfeasance in public office in a moment. And then what Lord Stein says is what can be said is that, of course, any plaintiff must have a sufficient interest to found a legal standing to sue. And subject to this qualification, principle does not require the introduction of proximity as a controlling mechanism in this corner of the law. Then this, the state of mind required to establish the tour, as already explained, as well as the special rule of remoteness hereafter discussed, keeps the tour within reasonable bounds. There is no reason why such an action cannot be brought by a particular class of persons. And in, in that particular case, it was depositors at a bank, even if their precise identities were not known to the bank. Causation then, and you'll note from the quote there from Lord Stein, that causation is an essential element of the plaintiff's cause of action. But what he then says is that, it's unsuitable, as the Court of Appeal found, and law just is old, unsuitable for summary determination. And he says that is plainly correct. Damage and remoteness then, the sixth ingredient, uh, the claims by the plaintiff are in respect to financial losses they suffered. Uh, they are, of course, claims for recovery of consequential economic losses. So there they were claiming for economic losses, but there are, of course, other types of loss, such as personal injury, which can be claimed for in misfeasance in public office. And then Lord Stein says, the question is when such losses are recoverable, it is convenient to consider it under the traditional heading of remoteness. And then it says, enough has been said to demonstrate the special nature of the tour and the strict requirements governing it. This is a legally sound justification for adopting as a starting point that in both forms of the tort, the intent required must be directed that the harm complained of, or at least to harm of the type suffered by plaintiffs. And then this results in the rule that a plaintiff or claimant must establish not only that the defendant acted in the knowledge that the act was beyond his powers, but also in the knowledge that his act will probably injure the plaintiff or person of a class of which the plaintiff was a member. So you may be asking yourself, well, what about damage and remoteness and recklessness? I've already mentioned the idea that misfeasance in public office can be committed by a reckless act. And what Lord Stein said was recklessness about the consequences of his act in the sense of not caring whether the consequences happen or not is therefore sufficient in law. And so the part of the quote that I read out just to remind you was that Lord Stein said in Free Rivers, it is not disputed that the principles of vicarious liability apply as much to misfeasance in public office as to other torts involving malice, knowledge or intention. And we're going to look at the issue of vicarious liability now. So 
the the starting point for this talk is to look at Mohammed and Morrison's supermarket a Supreme Court case in 2016. And the brief facts of the case were that the claimant had brought a claim against Morrison's for assault and battery. And what the claimant alleged was that he had had a, a conversation with an employee, uh, which resulted in the employee racially abusing and verbally abusing him in other ways and told him to leave the supermarket. The employee was then said to have followed the claimant to his car and then physically attacked him. Now, the claimant in that case brought the claim against Morrison's supermarket and the issue for the Supreme Court in broad terms was whether Morrison's could be vicariously liable for the employee's actions. And there's a two stage test in relation to vicarious liability um, set out at paragraph 44 in the Mohammed case, Lord Toulson talked about the first question being what functions or fields of activities have been entrusted by the employer to the employee or in everyday language, what was the nature of his job? And you can see how there's a synergy between that first part of the test and also the question of misfeasance in public office and who is a public officer and whether they're acting in their public function. The second part of the test is whether there's a sufficient connection between the position in which the person is employed and their wrongful conduct to make it right for the employer to be held liable under the principle of social justice. And Lord Toulson went on to say that it's not really possible to measure the closeness of a connection on a scale of one to 10. Um, it would be a forlorn exercise and what is more, it would miss the point. So the cases in which the necessary connection have been found are cases where an employee has used or misused, um, going back to what we're talking about, misfeasance in public office, I would add in abused, the position entrusted to him in a way which injured the third party. And particular relevance to the facts of the Mohammed case, Lord Toulson talks about the actions of the employee and says that it was a gross abuse of his position but it was in connection with the business in which he was employed to serve customers. So it arose out of his employment and his employers entrusted him with that position. And it is just that as between them and the claimant, they should be held responsible for their employees abuse of it. And then he says this, Mr. Khan's motive, that was the employee in that case is irrelevant. It looks obvious that he was motivated by personal racism rather than a desire to benefit him, his employer's business, but that is neither here nor there. So what you can see from that is that in a misfeasance in public office case, when you're looking at the question of vicarious liability, it may be that the person, the public officer, has a nefarious motive, which is nothing to do with the job that they're employed to do in the sense that it's not in their job description and far beyond the scope of what their employer expects of them but nevertheless, it can still be sufficiently closely connected to their employment, such that it's reasonable to hold the employer liable. So when can the tort of misfeasance in public office be used? Uh, it may be used as a sole cause of action, but it's often used in the alternative to another cause of action particularly if you have a case where there may be some difficulties in proving bad faith, you want to ensure that the claimant has another way in which to succeed in their case, you may plead another cause of action in the alternative. So some examples in the Free Rivers case, there were breaches of community law, as I mentioned, malicious prosecution, false imprisonment, where the act for the purposes of misfeasance might be arresting someone, detaining someone, an assault and battery, where the act for the purposes of misfeasance in public office is, is the assault itself. You may have data protection claims where the act is a disclosure of information improperly, misuse of private information, breach of confidence. You could even have a negligence claim where it's reckless. In the alternative, it's negligent. And also claims under the Human Rights Act. And a, a practical point is that where you have mis a misfeasance in public office claim, 
where possible, you may want to plead an alternative cause of action where the burden of proof is on the defendant. So that gives you two avenues, one where the burden of proof is on you and one where the burden of proof is on the defendant and you could succeed in one, um, which may fill a gap if you fail in the other. So when can the talk be used? Um, another way, uh, which I've already mentioned, is an obvious way. It is an alternative to malicious prosecution. And the case of Daniels, um, which is related to one of the cases that Stephen mentioned, the Moucher case, there was a question about the immunity that's afforded to witnesses when they're giving evidence and whether the claimants could proceed with misfeasance in public office claims in the alternative to malicious prosecution claims. And you'll see the answer as given by Lord Justice Lloyd-Jones there, um, paragraph 42, that the immunity applies to statements made by witnesses in the course of giving evidence and to certain limited but necessary extensions of that principle. So it's quite a limited immunity and the misfeasance in public office claims were allowed to proceed. Stephen's already mentioned um, the Reese case, and so I won't, I won't say much more than what's on the slide there. It's worth pursuing a misfeasance in public office claim as an alternative to malicious prosecution, because as in the Reese case, one of the claimants was able to succeed in misfeasance in public office where the malicious prosecution claim had failed. Uh, there's another case that's worth mentioning here in relation to the act. It's a case I was instructed in. And you can see there the brief facts were that the claimant, a former naval officer, had pleaded claims in assault and battery and misfeasance in public office in connection with her case that she'd been raped by a soldier on base in Gibraltar. And the defendant had obtained summary judgment in relation to the issue of vicarious liability and strike out in relation to the claimant's misfeasance in public office claim. And what, what the master did in that case was he looked at um, volume 69 of Holsbury's and relied on and quoted the definition set out there, which is the tort of misfeasance in public office may be committed by a local authority, either directly or vicariously through its officers or members. And it involves the unlawful exercise of power as a public officer, where either the conduct is intended to injure another or action is taken knowing or being reckless that there was no power to do so. And um, what the master concluded in that case as a result of relying on that definition was that the claimant's uh, alleged um, allegations, sorry, of rape and sexual assault could not be described as the improper execution of powers by a member of the armed forces. But Mr. Justice Sweeney, when the claimant appealed, um, went back to the Free Rivers judgment and some of the points I've been referring to today and said that while the quotation was accurate, it did not encompass the full scope of the tort. And so if the claimant had been given the opportunity, which she wasn't there, she would have been able to point to aspects of the Free Rivers judgment which supported her case, that the tort is not confined to acts that constitute an improper exercise of power, but includes illegal acts that are beyond the scope of any power. So if we think back to what the Supreme Court was saying in the Mohammed case, um, the Supreme Court was saying people can, um, employers or similar to employers, can be liable for acts that are not within the list of um, functions that a person is required to carry out for the purposes of their employment. And so in that case, the claimant succeeded in her appeal. So some conclusions then, first of all, misfeasance in public office is a useful tort. It can be used creatively to address a broad range of acts. We've looked at some of those today. It can be used as a standalone cause of action, but is often pleaded in alternative to a number of other causes of action or one of the cause of action. And 
there may be difficulties in establishing one or more elements of the tort, which is why it's useful to ensure you have the alternatives where possible. Thinking about if we're bringing a misfeasance in public office claim, it's essential to properly assess the viability of such a claim prior to pleading it. And when you've been through that assessment and concluded that it is viable to bring such a claim, it's essential to properly plead misfeasance in public office, taking into account some of those principles of vicarious liability when you have a case that's against an employer or similar. Thank you. Thanks, Yuna. I can see some movement in the Q&A box, which is great. Just a quick reminder that there is that option for you to ask any questions and we'll address them after Mike's talk. Uh, the other, um, or, or, or any comments or interesting experiences you've had in, 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 in these two areas of law. Our final speaker before we open this up for the Q&A is Michael Etienne. Michael has a broad public law and human rights practice encompassing actions against the state in various forms, but with a focus on cases involving detaining authorities, particularly police forces and prisons. He's frequently instructed on cases that give rise to issues of systemic discrimination, whether in the detention context or in his education law work. Michael has a particular focus on actions against the police and other detaining authorities in all of their forms, especially claims involving alleged breaches of the Human Rights Act and the Equality Act. With that in mind, he has been an active member of the Police Action Lawyers Group for several years. Michael also takes an active interest in issues of diversity and inclusion in the legal profession. And as such, he's a member of the steering committee of the Black Barristers Network, the Black Men in Law Network, and the recently launched Bridging the Bar. He won the Future Leader Diversity and Inclusion Award in the Chambers Award 2020 and was shortlisted in the Young Pro Bono Barrister of the Year category in the Advocate Pro Bono Awards in 2020. Over to you, Michael. Um, thanks very much, Fatima, and good evening. Um, before I get on to the substance of my talk, uh, I have to give my standard qualification to the introduction that always gets read out whenever I speak at these events, which is, I wrote it myself. Um, right, I'm going to try and screen share and see if that works. Just bear me for a second. This is a good start. Okay. Can Fatima, can you just give me a thumb, thumbs up if you can? You should only be able to see the PowerPoint presentation. No. No, I can see you. I can see your screen. So if you just maximise. The, the PowerPoint and then just from the beginning. Is that better? Not quite, just click from the beginning so that it's just playing. Yeah, perfect. Great. Um, so I will be speaking on the subject of damages and what I'm gonna do is mostly focus on um, some of the issues that arise from the back and forth in the re-litigation um, to which Stephen was referring earlier, and you'll notice that I um, cover some of the same ground, but hopefully not too much. <laughs> Just in case you'd already forgotten who I was. Um, I'm sorry, we'll just, just ignore that. Sorry, let me just take a few steps back. So it's useful to start uh, at one of the points where Stephen left off, and we can see... Um, in Reese, so one of the questions obviously is um, what constitutes damage? Um, and we know from Mr. Justice Mitting's first instance judgment that he concluded that the claimants had suffered no loss ultimately in misfeasance or malicious prosecution because um, they would have been prosecuted anyway. Uh, and we can see that with my emphasis um, in the last line of that paragraph. Um, in case it, uh, it may be obvious to many of you, but it's worth bearing in mind that in effect, those claims lost only on that, uh, effectively on that basis. 
Um, and you can see there he goes on at the following paragraph um, where he identified the basic question as to whether or not the claimant would have been charged, detained and brought for trial um, in any event. So that, that's the setup. Um, but we can see that the Court of Appeal disagreed um, for the reasons quite emphatically given um, that Stephen referred to earlier. Um, in essence, that it was inconceivable in this case that a, a proper prosecution would have been maintained. Oh. So that then obviously was sufficient to entitle the claimants uh, to damages. Uh, and the damages judgment was, um, at first instance, in the High Court, the judgment of Mrs. Justice uh, Chima Grubb. Uh, and the judgment starts with the uh, a familiar recitation of the principles from Thompson and Sue, which I know many of you will be um, very familiar with, so I won't repeat them. Um, but, but in essence, uh, reminding us of the um, basis for basic damages being the extent of the, the individual's loss, uh, aggravated damages, um, again, for circumstances in which uh, there is some feature that wouldn't be properly or adequately reflected in a standard award of basic damages. Uh, and then, of course, the um, uh, purpose for exemplary damages, um, which the court emphasised were, um, as they often do, uh, an exceptional remedy uh, uh, and reminding us also of the usual correlation between um, the rate for aggravated damages um, not being more than, generally speaking, more than twice the award of basic damages uh, and exemplary damages not being more than three times the award of um, basic damages ordinarily being capped, um, making proper account for inflation and so on at about £50,000. Um, but it's worth bearing in mind, as always, that the court also was alert to the fact that in circumstances where um, base, the basic award would be modest and potentially in circumstances where um, aggravating damages wouldn't be appropriate, um, the, there can be less of a connection between the um, exemplary award and a, and a basic damages award, which is less relevant for the particular circumstances of these appeals, um, such as they became, but is sometimes useful, um, particularly in the context of otherwise low value um, police actions. Um, one interesting point that arose, and of course, it, it's something that gets thrown at us all the time is, well, when you're dealing with torts that are essentially about damage to reputation, what do you do uh, when you have a, a so-called, well, a euphemistically described well-known claimant? Um, so the position of the police in this case essentially was, well, the claimants, apart from anything else, haven't suffered any damage in their reputation because none of them had any, had any uh, reputation to lose in the first place. So all three claimants had had historic um, involvement with the police, um, including spending time in custody um, and so on. And, and that, of course, is obviously relevant in the, in the context of false imprisonment as well, because it reduces the clang factor, um, which is also, uh, as we'll come to see, relevant in this case. Um, but it wasn't enough, despite what the defendant argued, to simply say, well, there was no damage in the, uh, any of the claimant's reputation because of their, effectively because of their bad character. And you can see one reason for that on the screen there, um, drawing reference to the Court of Appeal decision of 2006 in Manly, um, which, it, basically amounts to the point that when you have somebody who is um, facing an incredibly serious charge, the fact that they have had previous involvement with the police um, at least reduces in significance. Um, I won't read the quote there, but the point is, if you're accused of something as serious as murder, uh, then that will be a cause of anxiety and distress to you um, in circumstances where it turns out to have been a malicious allegation whether or not you've been involved with the authorities before. Um, and uh, the other point, which I think is um, also worth bearing in mind, I think it's quite an astute observation that was made in the course of these proceedings, um, was that people who have been 
previously involved with the police for whatever reason, um, but but on the wrong side of things, are at more risk of falling victim to police corruption. Uh, and reading between the lines, you can see why that might be, precisely because they know that people who have got bad character will have their credibility challenged and may be um, less liable to be believed. Um, so it's, it's interesting in this case that, as we'll come to see, it was a factor which increases a person's risk of being subjected to um, malicious conduct, uh, sorry, malicious conduct, but um, as we'll come to see, also a factor in reducing um, potentially different elements of any damages award. Uh, now, uh, obviously, the, the most obvious form of damage um, that, that we focus on in, in malicious prosecution cases is the risk of, um, or, or is, is the prosecution. Uh, but, but something that becomes quite clear in looking at these cases, uh, and it's a point that um, Mrs. Justice Grubb was alive to, um, is that it's not just the prosecution, actually. Uh, it's the jeopardy to which the claimant is put um, simply by virtue of the allegations being made. So in the context of a murder charge, um, as she explains at paragraph 13, um, in this case, a senior police officer made a determined attempt to achieve their convictions. Um, the jeopardy of the murder charge, both reputationally and potential life sentences, as well as the length of time of the, of the proceedings, um, were very important factors. And uh, the reason that that had particular importance in this case was because, um, as Stephen described, um, in the end, there was no trial. Um, but there was um, an extensive voir dire. Uh, and for that reason, Mrs Justice Scrub rejected the defendant's argument that damages should be substantially reduced. Um, and she summarises uh, what Stephen was describing in more detail earlier, um, the lengthy process um, that was undertaken in the context of the voir dire with uh, witnesses being subject to examination, cross-examination and so on. Um, and we'll see as a consistent theme in this case, the fact that the proceedings obviously um, went, were, were being pursued for a very lengthy period of time. Um, and I've touched on this already, um, but other forms of loss, the obvious one um, in the context of loss of liberty uh, and the court, uh, and Mrs. Justice Scrub emphasises the need um, to make sure that there's a separately identified element of damages um, for the loss of liberty uh, in the context of a malicious prosecution. Um, but that ultimately what we get to in terms of loss of liberty, what we're looking for is a, is a global assessment um, as opposed to the daily rate. And you'll see reference there to the um, very old prison case of Brockhill, um, which endorses that view, but also makes reference, um, I think makes certain references that might suggest um, something that looks a little bit like a, like a daily rate. But in any case, what we're looking for is a global figure. And we'll come to see that um, taking a global approach um, is... Uh, an important feature of this case when we get to the stage of the appeal. Now, another question that, uh, that arises often is, well, what, do, what sorts of cases do we take as our comparators when we're trying to persuade the court uh, what the, the appropriate level should be? Um, now, in this case, there was particular reliance um, placed on behalf of the first claimant on immigration detention cases uh, and we can see the discussion of it there. And in the, in the case that was relied on, and there was an award of £80,000. Now, the, the police had argued, well, you can't, you can't rely on these cases because they're, they're in a very particular context. Effectively, they're a context of their own. Um, and because it's so different, there's not much use, much use that can be made of them. Um, we'll come to see that... The, the court doesn't accept, Mr. Justice Grubb doesn't accept that, and, and nor does um, the Court of Appeal. Um, although it is recognised. Is everything all right, Fatima? Yeah, 
Okay, so I just saw Fatima pop up on my screen, which is normally a sign that um, something's gone wrong somewhere. Um, so that they are useful as a check, uh, but how useful they are um, has to always be taken in context, given that there are obviously very particular features of, of immigration cases, particularly um, in those circumstances where somebody is liable to be deported uh, and or has concerns about being exposed to torture um, or other ill treatment or discrimination. Um, and again, we can see the increase in the basic award um, to take account of the fact that although there wasn't a trial, the proceedings were not abandoned immediately and went on for quite some time after um, the corrupted evidence had been rejected. Uh, some discussion of, of aggravated damages, and you can see there, there was a recitation of the uh, Thompson features, the circumstances in which aggravated damages will be justified, uh, where the behaviour of the defendant has been high-handed, insulting, malicious or oppressive, and so on. Um, and we can see there a reference to Stephen's submissions, um, which place particular emphasis on, on the drawn-out nature of the proceedings. Um, there had been, the defendant basically argued um, against both aggravated and exemplary damages. Um, spoiler alert, the defendant lost on both. Um, not much of a spoiler for those of you, of course, who um, were following the proceedings and have read the judgment. Um, and it was quite clear in the, in the judge's view that the, the award of aggravated damages was, was plainly mer merited. Um, what we're dealing with is a senior officer who has acted cynically um, to manipulate the evidence, um, effectively for his own gain, exposing people to a risk of a very serious criminal conviction. And for the same reason, um, an award of exemplary damages was awarded um, because, yes, the award of exemplary damages is exceptional, um, but effectively the significance of this case the public interest in the case and its notoriety could not be underestimated. And we can see a prescient reference um, in the first instance judgment to um, the independent panel into the murder of Daniel Morgan, uh, which reported recently. Um, a couple of points that are, uh, are worth um, always bearing in mind, um, picking up on uh, Eunice's presentation and um, the fact that the award is being made against the defendant on a vicarious basis is a factor to be considered in the assessment of quantum, uh, although it's not determinative. And as we'll come to see, there were very significant awards made in this case, notwithstanding that. Um, there's also concern for the cost to the public purse and the fact, uh, and so the fact that the money is coming from public funds, again, might be cause for the court to hesitate, particularly in the award of exemplary damages. But again, there, are, there will be cases, and Reese is one, um, where that will not be enough to prevent such an award. Um, and we can see references to that uh, at paragraph 45 uh, of the first instance judgment, and again um, at paragraph 8. So just running through quickly, I'm conscious of time, just, just dealing very briefly with what the awards actually were. So the first two claimants were given the same award, totaling £155,000. And you can see how that breaks down. Um, it's worth bearing in mind that there was a global award made of exemplary damages of £150,000 to be split equally between each of the claimants. Um, and the third claimant got a slightly smaller award to reflect the fact that he had been lawfully in prison um, for at least some of the period during which the proceedings were being pursued against him. Uh, but what had happened was the effect of the proceedings ultimately prevented him being um, released at, at the halfway point of his sentence. And it was at that point that his, um, he was entitled to damages in effect for, un, for uh, loss of liberty. Uh, it's worth noting that um, in addition to costs, um, it was hoped that the parties would be able to agree an award of interest uh, and the award of interest is something which is taken um, as the case proceeds to the Court of Appeal. So Jonathan Rees 
Um, so only one of the three claimants appeals. Um, it's worth noting in the judgment that there's no issue taken um, about the fact that there was an attempt by the defendant to challenge the quantum in this case, despite the fact that not all of the original claimants were parties to the appeal. Um, effectively, it wasn't an issue in the case because counsel for the police um, gave an undertaking that the defendant wouldn't be seeking to uh, reduce or recover any damages from the defendant, sorry, from either of the other two claimants if the appeal were successful. So perhaps, um, as we saw um, in some of the litigation around DSC, trying to lay a marker um, for future cases. Um, so Jonathan Rees appealed on two grounds. Effectively, he said that the award that he was given for loss of liberty was too low and that the judge was wrong um, not to make an award of interest. Uh, the police appealed, um, certainly on the quantum value of the award of exemplary damages. So the argument was effectively that £150,000 was too great. Um, the reason I have put on the slide there, um, award of exemplary, the award of exemplary damages question mark is because it wasn't entirely clear whether there was an appeal against the, the um, granting of exemplary damages at all. Um, in any case, the court made the court of appeal made clear that it would have would have rejected um, such an appeal if it had been made. But we'll come to the cross appeal in a second. Um, there are some early indicators in the judgment as to the direction of travel from the court of appeal, um, who uh, praised the very thorough approach, um, the conscious uh, sorry the um, conspicuously thorough and careful approach of Mrs. Justice Grubb, um, and it goes to the trouble of setting out um, by reference to several paragraphs in the judgment, the different factors that were considered. Uh, and we can see some of those there. Um, just drawing attention to one point that I didn't cover earlier in the presentation, that there was a, a small uplift in the awards um, because the defendants, as a result of the charges they were facing, were detained in category A conditions. Um, and that was um, a feature that there was an uplift for in the basic award. Um, and it sets out quite clearly the individual components um, and the, uh, the judge's concern to avoid double counting. Um, as I indicated earlier, she was mindful of the fact that exemplary damages were exceptional uh, and paid regard to the potential impact on the public purse. Um, for all of those reasons, in essence, the um, appeal against the award of uh, the damages award failed. Um, as you'd expect, the court emphasised that uh, the court of appeal will be very slow to displace an award of damages um, at first instance because um, that reflects a fact sensitive balance and assessment by the judge. Um, and in this case, the judge had been um, incredibly thorough. And despite some of the submissions made on the appeal had considered all of the relevant factors. Uh, and that's why I say um, no luck and no interest. Um, on the question of it, in fact, I'll come back to the question of interest last, um, just on the cross appeal. So the Court of Appeal went on to say, um, if there had been an attempt to appeal the award of exemplary damages at all, it would have been rejected. Uh, and they also rejected the appeal um, against the value of the uh, exemplary damages award, essentially because all the relevant factors have been considered. Um, but the Court of Appeal, as all of the previous judgments had done in this case, emphasised the exceptional nature of this case. And that might be something that's worth bearing in mind. Um, of course, it doesn't mean that there aren't lots of useful details in this case for, for, for other potential decisions. There are. Um, but certainly on the question of exemplary damages, that by any measure, this was a very exceptional case. Just very briefly, on the uh, issue of interest, uh, the Court of Appeal rejected the, the um, claim by Mr. Reese that there ought to have been an award of interest on the um, damages for malicious prosecution uh, uh, and misfeasance. Uh, and essentially because there's authority um, that says that the, the, the purpose of those, and it's a case called Saunders, um, the purpose of those damage, the, the purpose of damages is to obviously reflect the harm caused uh, to the claimant, um, but it's not part of those damages to explicitly um, 
oh, they're not they're not eligible for interest because actually the award of interest is an exceptional feature of personal injury claims. Um, the way in which uh, the, the impact on the claimant in terms of how long things have taken is reflected in the award of damages is not an interest, but actually in how you look at the basic award. So um, what you're then doing is saying, well, as in this case, and that's why the, the issue of time is important, the length of time that proceedings take to be concluded is an important factor, and that should be reflected in the basic award. And um, that was something that had been done. Um, and so the general position will be um, that that's better reflected in uh, basic damages and not a separate award for interest. So that is a very brief, um, I think, um, canter through damages uh, and how they played out in the course of the Reese litigation. Thanks very much. Thank you, Mike. And uh, thank you also to Stephen and Yuna for your very informative talks. Um, we've got a couple of questions. Um, I'm going to start by going to uh, Stephen Simblet, please. Um, there is a question in, in the Q&A uh, from Chairs Cotton. What are the cost implications of pleading misfeasance and an alternative if you lose one of them? Yeah, hi. Um... <laughs> Obviously, one has to take care over this sort of thing, and there will be um, arguments on costs if you um, plead something and fail in it. But I think they're not very strong arguments in this sort of case for those um, sorts of talks, because essentially, um, if the case is pleaded in the way that um, Una was describing in misfeasance or how we would conventionally lead it in malicious prosecution um, the, and you win on one of those then you have in, in, in effect established very serious conduct in bad faith and the evidence that you will have that, that will have been covered on, on both of those will overlap extremely um, closely so it's unlikely to be the case that anybody is going to be able to point to any um, significant costs consequences of um, pursuing one of the torts um, in, instead of the other. Or I'm not putting that very clearly, but uh, basically it's hard to think of circumstances where you would, for instance, fail in malicious prosecution, but win in misfeasance in public office and have um, racked up lots of significant costs that were only attributable to the malicious prosecution claim. And there's quite a useful case that Leslie Thomas did called Fleming uh, and Chief Constable of Sussex, where, Les where Leslie's client had lost on false imprisonment, but won on malicious prosecution. And, you know, when the, the, and the police tried to say there should be issue-based cost orders or you shouldn't get any costs, something like that. But the, um, the, the judge pointed out that you, you look at the amount of time that had been spent on these things. And since the same people, the same police officers were giving the evidence about, about the uh, malicious prosecution claim, as, as were the, the ones involved in the arrest and the false imprisonment claim, it didn't make any difference, really, to the um, way in which the, the, the court's time had been allocated. So although it's um, something to be mindful of, it's also not something to be put too um, too cautious about because as a matter of practicality, I think you'd be quite unlucky to end up in a situation where there was any or any uh, significant reduction in costs. Um, obviously, you know, when we get onto costs, people then start trying to say, well, you know, trying to run any, any losing defendant in this sort of case where the costs are going to be significant is going to get onto all sorts of arguments about this, that, and the other. And it's, a, and it's part of the general bargaining and the hedging process that go, goes on there. But I, I would be very surprised if there would be a case in which somebody had won in misfeasance in, in public office, um, lost malicious prosecution, and didn't get 50% of their costs. Sorry, and didn't get, and, and, and ended up only getting 50% of their costs, or indeed vice versa. So I hope that's, I hope that's, a, that's probably the best I can do. Thanks, Stephen. Um, 
You know, there's a question from David Hogarth in the in the Q and A. Could a local authority's failure to conduct an effective investigation of the suspected breach of the Human Rights Act be misfeasance? Yes, in in theory, yes, it could. But thinking back to the high tests that one has to meet in order to succeed in misfeasance in public office, you are probably going to need a situation where the let's say it's the police and um, the police have been aware of evidence and deliberately ignored that evidence um, or, or worse, destroyed that evidence, whatever it might be. You're going to need something approaching that level, probably. Um, if you're looking at a case where they have failed and it's something akin to negligence, then you would need something higher to establish uh, reckless indifference to what was going on. So, yes, you, you can, in theory... But the other issue you may encounter is if you have a Human Rights Act claim where you are claiming for, let's say, distress, but falling short of psychiatric injury, you, you, you would succeed potentially in your Human Rights Act claim on that basis and may be awarded damages. But in your claim in misfeasance in public office, you're going to need to demonstrate loss. So if it was um, either some financial loss, economic loss, like it was in the Free Rivers case, or you're going to need to show that you've suffered personal injury reaching the level of a recognised psychiatric condition. So yes, in theory, but um, there won't be that many cases where you can establish both a failure to investigate and meet the high threshold that's required for a misfeasance in public office, but certainly it's possible. Thanks, Una. And just sticking to you for a moment, there's another um, question on misfeasance from uh, an anonymous attendee. Could this be used where a police officer knowingly gives wrong details of a person's past non-convictions, i.e. he committed the offence when it was found he did not? Yes, I think the key word there is knowingly. If you have a police officer who knowingly shares incorrect information, then that could amount to a misfeasance in public office. But the same answer applies as in relation to the question I've just answered. You're going to need to be able to demonstrate some loss arising from that, whether it's psychiatric injury or, for example, if somebody could establish that they'd lost a job as a result of that information being shared. So, so yes, again, the answer is it's possible, but you need to be able to meet the high threshold required for the talk. Thanks, Una. Um, Stephen, I'm going to come back to you because there was just a follow up question um, on your point. Um, and you explained where it's malicious prosecution and misfeasance. Um, a lot of the evidence is, is, is kind of for both talks. And so it's unlikely to have cost implications. But the follow up question is where it's, for example, false imprisonment and the other ones listed. Perhaps that's less clear. Uh, do, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, I mean, that's that's right. Um, there may well be circumstances where the uh, claim in false imprisonment ends up being based on, uh, it ends up involving different witnesses um, from the malicious prosecution claim. And of course, there are different um, standards of proof. Um, I mean, the, the comparison that I was commenting on was what we're talking about in this, which is the interrelationship between misfeasance in public office and malicious prosecution. And there, I think I stick by the answer I gave before. But yes, it's in, it is important in any of these police cases not to get too gung-ho about putting down every cause of action that might possibly arise uh, without keeping an eye on what the, um, what the evidence is um, on, 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 the substant on, on the substantive sort of essentially assertion that somebody's done something wrong uh, and, um, and, and bear in mind that, you know, it's, in, it, you're, it's only the claimant that loses out by pursuing speculative claims. So it's also important to look at, at the, when it comes to costs. So it's also important to look at the, what, what damages you're going to get. I mean, you know, if in fact you've got some theoretical claim for, um, trespass or something, which you might get 250 quid for, but could involve all sorts of technical legal arguments. But really, you 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 were then framed for a very serious offence, which will, which if you win on that, you're going to get tens of thousands of pounds. Then why bother? I mean, that applies to every in in every aspect of police law. I think. Thank you, Stephen. Um, Una, did you want to come in on that as well? Yeah, that 
that links back to the point I made right at the end, my presentation about the first thing to do is, as Stephen said, don't be gung ho about it. Properly assess whether you have a viable misfeasance in public office claim. And then only if you do plead it and make sure you plead it carefully. And what, where it might be useful and where it has the potential to increase damages is if you have a cause of action, which is your kind of primary cause of action and where you are unlikely because of the nature of that cause of action to get aggravated and or exemplary damages, then you may plead misfeasance in public office in the alternative so that you can attract those higher level damages. So it, it, it's always a tactical decision. Um, one shouldn't just rush in and plead things no matter what, but it's one to think about when thinking about the nature of your case and where you are likely to benefit from it and the cost implications if it's pleaded unsuccessfully. Thanks, um, Una. Um, I, I've also noticed a couple of comments in the chat, uh, largely requesting legal um, support. And whilst everyone on all of our panelists appreciate how difficult it is to challenge uh, the police without any legal support, particularly we, we're all all too familiar, unfortunately, with the limitations of legal aid, but this isn't the right platform and our panelists, unfortunately, can't give uh, individual legal advice. So we would advise you to please contact specialist solicitors or contact the direct access team um, at Garden Court Chambers. I'll end by thanking again, um, Stephen, Una and Michael for your very interesting talks and contributions. Uh, everyone for joining us and, and your interesting questions and contributions as well. And I hope you all have a lovely evening.